tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. Oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Tuckheads Tuesday that we're actually recording right at the end of Monday Night Football as the Bucks beat down the Philadelphia Eagles. We thought might as well just get it over with, get it done. I have three games I wanted to talk to you about. Didn't want to wait until the morning. Hopefully you guys will be excited that we got this up, ready, and posted for you bright and early for everyone. It's only a Tuesday, but it, we don't have Power Rankings Tuesday anymore. I'm almost sad that we don't have Power Rankings Tuesday anymore. We do have winners, though, every week. That's someone that spreads the word via social media. Remember, at Ross Tucker Pod, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Reply to the live stream, please. At Ross Tucker Pod. That's the key. Sponsor confirmation email winner. There's a lot of good ones. It's easy to do. Maybe you just get the West Shore Home free consultation. Any of these. Send it to me, Ross at RossTucker.com. Or even if you just rate and review the show. That's, that counts as a sponsor confirmation email winner. YouTube shout out is really fun. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. Just subscribe and then reply to any video with a comment. You know what else is fun? Talking with my guy, Jason McCourty. I think you guys will enjoy this. Had a blast working with him this year. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. All right, I've been looking forward to getting this guy on the show for a long time. I've known him for like 15 years, I think, going back. To when he was coming out of Rutgers, but got a chance to work with him a bunch this past season. Awesome. Ask Kyle Brandt, ask Peter Schrager, ask Jamie Erdahl on Good Morning Football. Ask me whether it's NFL or college football. Really, really good at what he does, but an awesome guy. You can check him out on social media, especially now that he has his own social media <laughs> handle. Uh, at Jason McCordy. Jason, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Really appreciate it. Oh, anytime. It's always a pleasure to hang out with D. Ross Tucker. I love that you got the NFL Plus NFL <laughs> Plus hoodie on, man. Like, do they make you wear that if you do an appearance on somebody else's show or what? No, it's just free gear. You know how it is. Early morning show, you just throw on the free hoodie and you go out next thing you know, you're rocking it for the entire day. So everything is going streaming now. So I'm just, we got Peacock. We got all these different things going on. I'm repping for the plus, we call it. Did you wear that on Good Morning Football today? I did. I did. You know, you know, fashion's a big thing for me on the show. I don't know if I can wear a free sweatshirt. People are going to start to come for me if this is my, my gear I'm going in with on a daily basis. Yeah, you're right. Fashion matters. You do the fit list on Good Morning Football. That and the uh, the championship belt for the DBs are two <laughs> of my favorite segments on the show. I, I would think, though, the NFL would have loved it if you did wear that sweatshirt. <laughs> no that doubt about me, it. By the way, if I was on Good Morning Football... I would wear some type of free thing I got from somebody in the NFL every day. And if they wanted me to wear NFL Plus every day, I would do it. Just cut the check, baby. Cut the check. Hey, I wanted to ask you, because they're both in the news, about your perspective and thoughts on Bill Belichick and Gerard Mayo uh, for different, different perspectives, since you know both of them well. Let's start with Belichick. And I want to, Jason, just kind of give you a – a blank slate, say whatever you want to say about him. person, coach, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you think of him moving forward, just your thoughts on Belichick. I'm sure people ask you about him all the time. Yeah, and I'll send a scene of, like, my relationship with Bill because I'm always confused with Deb, who was there for 13 years in his entire career. For me, I got a chance to join New England. It was my 10th year in the NFL, so my prior nine years never made the playoffs. It was only on two – two seasons out of those nine where we even had a winning record at the end. So when I showed up to New England, it was coming off a 0-16 season with the Cleveland Browns. And I remember the first day I ended up getting traded there in March. And I go in, you got to sign the paperwork and do all of that stuff. And I have a meeting with Belichick. And he says to me, I think you can offer a great perspective on this football team. Because they were coming off that, won the Super Bowl, um, I believe it was versus Atlanta. They had lost the next year in the Super Bowl versus the Eagles. He said, like, we have guys on this football team that think we're in the Super Bowl because of them. They have no idea what it's really like in the NFL to have this type of success. And it was like someone like you has been a good player. 
you could offer a ton of perspective to a lot of these young guys in this locker room. And I remember early on, and obviously I'm getting I'm getting a chance to play with my twin brother. And the way he is is totally different of what I expected going in. And that's what Deb telling me about the place and all of that for the past eight seasons he had been there. But you walk in and you think it's going to be this extremely militant place. I had left Cleveland where we had to show up to meetings wearing the same thing as a team. Everybody had to have the same gray T-shirt on, the same brown shorts at every single meeting and be uniform. And I get to New England, and we also had to show up five minutes early to every meeting. Like, if you weren't five minutes early, you were late because Hugh Jackson would start the meeting early, and he would look at you crazy if you walked in three minutes before the meeting. So I get to New England. My first meeting uh, is in April, and it's off-season workouts, meetings at 8 o'clock. Everybody's hanging out in the locker room. Also, you know how it is. And 7.58 hits. And I look at my brother, and I'm like, Yo, are, are we not? Is the meeting not in the team meeting room? He said, oh, we're good. Nobody's late until it's 8.01. And I was like, really? So you'd walk in and meet and Bill be at the front and it'd be eight o'clock and you'd walk in or maybe as someone's walking in kind of late, but it's still eight o'clock. He just look at you and say, good morning. You go to your seat. You'd be in there in the back with your hood on, different things. All he cared about was the X's and O's. Do your job. Are you prepared? Are you executing? Do you know what the hell we're doing from a scheme standpoint? As long as you did those things and you carried your way, carried yourself the way that he expected you to, you would be okay. Now, it wasn't for everybody but I learned a ton of football from being there. And it was the expectation to win every single week. The Patriots were a team that went in where every season it was like, right, what do we have to do to win the Super Bowl this year? We'll worry about next year, next year. But we were going out to actually win the whole daggone thing. And prior for me in my career, we had ne I'd never been on a team where you could have showed up in September and said, all right, like we're going out to win the, to win the whole Super Bowl. No one was ever preparing to that level. So – when you ask me, I definitely think Bill can still coach. I think it's a matter of our, who's going to be the offensive coordinator, how he fills out his staff at this point, because so many of them have been across the league coaching elsewhere. But I do think his technique still works because he's evolved over the years. We used to have guys that was in that first dynasty with the New England Patriots come back and say how soft he was compared to what he was like when he was coaching us. So I think that is any head coach when you've done it for a long time, whether that's Tomlin, Harbaugh, if you're going to continue to be successful at this thing, you have to evolve as players change. So it's interesting that you say that because I was not there that long. I was there the second half of the 05 season, 06 off season till during training camp, I got traded to Cleveland. And the one thing I've wondered, and, and you were there more recently and your brother was there even more recently than that, is when I was there, Jay, it was like a hundred percent negative reinforcement. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. and not, not like mean, although sometimes it was, but like 8 AM was the low lights of the practice the oh, day yeah. before or the game. I don't know what you guys called them. And I guess I was curious if like, whether or not that still worked for the young guys. Now the 20 somethings, in other words, I was kind of thinking like, if you were going to hire a 70 something year old coach, coach, would it be Pete Carroll who's like optimistic and building guys up and rah, rah, and trying to pump guys up and be yourself? Or would it be negative reinforcement Belichick? And you said he softened up a little bit, so maybe he did. But do you think that was he still negative reinforcement for you? And do you think that that can still work? It was still negative reinforcement. And great thing for me, every team I was on, now it might not have been to the X kind of thing. The difference was we were weren't in the league. You know, Bill would do it in a team meeting room. Anytime you got in your position meeting room or defense offense, you'd go over negative plays. Bill would put them out in front of the team meeting room. And yeah, that was still a thing while I was there. But what I thought was unique, no different than a household where you might have a parent who teaches from a negative reinforcement standpoint, it helps band the guys together. So what I always found interesting is we'd be in a meeting and he might have killed a defensive lineman in OTAs for getting pushed out of a gap. And we'd get back in the locker room and instantly everybody would start cracking jokes and talking about the comments or whatever Bill would have said in that, in that space to get his point across to whatever, say, given player. And I felt like that helped bring the locker room together because it became, all right, as players, we got a band together. If coaches are saying this, that, and the third, we're complaining, and then we go out there and we try to execute together. And I think the chemistry that was built in the locker room, it exceeded all of the coaching or negative, whatever it had to do with the execution that was out there on game day. But to your point, whether it's a Pete Carroll or Bill Belichick standpoint, times have changed this, that, and the third. I look at it as 
we've had some really talented teams throughout the NFL. You look at Aaron Rodgers, and we often call him the most talented quarterback, and the Drew Brees or the Peyton Mannings. Nobody was able to get a quarterback and win six championships the way Bill did with Tom Brady. And I think some of that negative reinforcement and the high expectation and the standards that were set every single day, no matter what the level of success that was reached, I think that helped them sustain the success that they had for 20 years of being able to win that many times in two different regimes in a sense of the early 2000s and the late, in the, uh, late 2010s. To me, I think you sometimes need that negative reinforcement to continue to win in the way that they did. Jason, I wrote this, I said this on yesterday's show, um, and I posted on social media. I'm surprised the Patriots didn't interview anybody else. Mm. And, and the reason why I say that is, why not get like somebody else's perspective on an organization that's been struggling? And I know you know Gerard Mayo, and I'm going to ask you about him, the person next. But all he knows is the Patriot way. Played there, coached there, never been anywhere else. And my whole thing was, even if you knew you were going to hire him, I would have interviewed five other guys to A, hear what they say about the Patriots and why we're not good. And then B, so when I hire Mayo, I can say, hey, we interviewed this guy and Ben Johnson and this guy and this guy, but Mayo was the best guy. What do you think about the process the Patriots went through of, of not going through a process of just giving the job to Mayo? I was probably surprised as well. I, I thought that they would go through some form of a process. I wasn't really aware that they could just transition into Mayo the way that they did, although it had been done a few times in the past. I think it speaks volumes to who Gerard is as a person and what they see in him. But I also think from an organization standpoint, New England has been, this is only their fourth head coach in his franchise history because it was Parcells, Pete Carroll, then Bill Belichick. I was very impressed by the way they rolled it out. And I respect that opinion. I probably, and I felt the same of, yeah, you go out there and you interview people and you figure out what's the best thing going right now because you've had the same coach for the past 24 years. But the season ends on a Sunday. Bill handles his pressure the way he does of not knowing what the future is going to hold. Next thing you know, Thursday, Bill's out. That's 7 o'clock in the morning. We find out that they're parting ways, Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick. Friday morning around the same time, we find out Gerard Mayo's the head coach going into a weekend where now we're talking about the six playoff games that are happening. Now come Monday, the news cycle has already passed. And I felt like just the way it was bang, 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 it was so well done of having a plan of what's next, that it wasn't just, are right, we falling on our face, we're starting from scratch, and we got to figure out what's the way up. I think those conversations with Gerard of what they feel like needs to happen to improve, they felt really good about. And those conversations were probably ongoing of having an idea of what it's going to take to get this team back over the top. I will say, though, know, with Gerard, although he's coached and played his entire career in New England, Gerard's a totally different personality than Bill Belichick. And I'm fascinated to see how he handles this organization moving forward. That's really interesting. In what way? Now, Gerard's a guy, you just mentioned, a Pete Carroll of positivity and vibrant. We're watching D'Amico Ryans on the sideline and talking about being super positive with his guys. He was a linebacker and captain. Gerard is very much the same. Gerard is a people person. I said it on Good Morning Football. His specialty is people, being able to connect with you, being able to make you feel welcome. Um, that positive reinforcement, totally opposite of what we talked about. When he walked in the building in 2019, he took over the linebacker group that it had um, Jamie Collins, Kyle Van Noy, Dante Hightower, all guys that were veteran, then young guys like Jawan Bentley and Landon Roberts, who was in his fourth year. And Gerard took over, and those guys, it wasn't on film of just beating you down or anything of that nature. Whenever he walks in a room, you're upbeat, you're smiling, because that's his personality, and those are his characteristics that he follows with. So I think people are going to walk in expecting, like, all right, he was Bill Belichick's middle linebacker. He drafted him in the first round. He was all pro, pro bowl, all of those different things. And now he's coached under him. He's going to be the same guy. I think something as small as the press conferences and stuff when he talks to the media, totally different because he's not the same guy. It would have to take a complete 180 for him to change and be the same way. And that's not a negative or a shot at Bill Belichick. I just think for Gerard, it's going to be different because I don't think he can replicate what Bill is on a daily basis because that would be changing who he is at his core. Jason's awesome, almost as awesome as getting a brand new bath, a brand new shower, which you can do at westshorebath.com. So first of all, we already did this. 
okay, last year, and you guys heard me talk about it. I'm legit excited. In a couple weeks, we're actually getting a new front door. They do entryways as well. So they do doors as well. It's not just incredible baths and showers. Absolutely love it. WestShoreBath.com. Schedule your free design consultation at a time that works for you. Plus, get in on their New Year savings event now. I don't know how long that thing lasts. WestShoreBath.com. Tux Takes. All right, Ross, we'll get to the game we didn't get to the other day. Detroit, they held L.A. to just three points in the second half. They win their first playoff game in 32 years, 24-23. And I know some uh, fans were and listeners were disappointed that we weren't able to do it on uh, yesterday's show. But, you know, I think most people know this now, but we do it, the, the show, the video of the show is posted on the DraftKings network. So that goes on, where does it all go, Jack? Roku, Samsung TV Plus. Which one am I missing? There's, I think it's like Uvi or something. I'm the name, the exact name is slipping me at this point, at this point in time. Tubi but... or Zoomi? One of those. At any rate, that's why the show is, is about 25 minutes. And that's why we couldn't fit in the Lions and the Rams. But we got plenty of time for them right now. Just an insane atmosphere. An absolutely insane atmosphere and chanting, Jared Goff, Jared Goff, Jared Goff, Jared Goff. It was awesome. Loved them going ahead and showing their appreciation for him. They booed Stafford. I don't think it was about Stafford. I think it was about Goff. Anyway, I said this, I tweeted this, Jack, at Ross Tucker NFL. I'm only on sideline twice a year. So uh, I'll be on the sideline for the, I think, the AFC Championship again. I truly wish all of you could be on the sideline for NFL game once in your life. Just to see the speed, the intensity, the ferocity. It is really, it's, it's incredible. It's spectacular. And I, I said that on social media, at Ross Tucker NFL, encourage you to check that out. The first half was electric, 21-17, three scores each. The Lions were surgical, three straight 75-yard touchdown drives to start that game. Unbelievable. And while while Stafford, I mean, some incredible throws. I mean, golf was surgical, but Stafford made ridiculous throws, uh, it's kind of crazy to think that the Lions only scored one field goal the whole rest of the game after those three touchdowns on the first three drives. I'm telling you right now, Jack, Puka Nakua, he's one of my five favorite players in the NFL. Crazy physical as a blocker. Crazy physical run after the catch. I love that guy. Absolutely love what I've seen from Puka Nakua. And the other thing that jumped out to me, one of them at least, under center play action, aggressive fourth down play calling. I felt like, now they both stalled out a little bit after that, but I felt like it's like the future of football watching these guys. And it's crazy to me that the most aggressive play caller and on fourth downs in the NFL is a former blocking tight end, teammate of mine, Dan Campbell. The Lions uh, ended up stiffening and forcing the Rams to settle for field goals in the red zone. That ended up being the difference in the game. It it really was. Aiden Hutchinson had a big game. I don't know if you saw this, Jack, on my social media, at Ross Tucker NFL, but after the game, I interviewed him. No idea who they were playing, that they had a home game. Asked me who they were playing. By the way, I I know now, Aiden, it's the Bucs. You're playing the Bucs Sunday at 3. So, so happy for Lions fans. You guys deserve it. So, side note, it was Zumo was the name of the other streaming network that we were trying to figure out. Pittsburgh, they struggle on the road in Buffalo, setting up the Bills' third playoff matchup against the Chiefs in four years. The snow made for such a cool scene, both in and out of the stadium. The Bills were marching early on, 
uh, for tight ends, touchdowns to Dawson Knox and Dalton Kincaid, including an absolute seed to Dalton Kincaid by Josh Allen. The Steelers, the turnovers, man, they could have won the game. But the Steelers' turnovers, like the Pickens fumble, uh, the Kyer Elam interception that Mason Rudolph threw, not good, really held them back. How about the Josh Allen Superman 52-yard touchdown to make it 21 nothing? Honestly, they were about to get run out of the building, totally run out of the building when it was 21 nothing. But then there was a blocked field goal towards the end of the first half, which uh, by the Steelers. Questionable decision by McDermott to kick that field goal. That led to Deontay Johnson touchdown for 21-7 score at halftime. Uh, linebacker Terrell Bernard looked like a bad injury. That would be bad for the Bills, by the way. Steelers solid comeback in the second half with Mason Rudolph to make it 24-17. But Bills answer with impressive drive. It was some James Cook. It was a Josh Allen run. It was a throw to Diggs. And then Shakir, what a catch and run for the final margin, 31-17. Hopefully everybody got home safe from that game in Buffalo. And whether they were hosting game day or movie night, I'm telling you, DiGiorno knows that planning a watch party on a budget isn't easy. You need the perfect setting, perfect squad, and the perfect eats. Luckily, you're a game time mastermind. And you know that grabbing a DiGiorno classic crust pizza can bring home a dub because it's packed with half a pound of cheese, sauce, other toppings, and comes at an incredible price. Make the game winning call and grab a DiGiorno classic crust pizza from the grocery store today. It's not delivery, it is DiGiorno. You got to wash it down, Jack. You know the deal by now. Wash it down with Labatt Blue Light. Absolutely delicious. Live life with your friends and live life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer. Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. Philadelphia's collapse reaches its peak with just an overall meltdown Tampa Bay, 32-9. Wow. Just wow. And honestly, I, I can't say I'm that surprised. I mean, if you watch them play the last couple games, it... It's impossible to be that surprised with what happened, right? I mean, they were horrendous on defense the last two games and not really that great on offense either. They didn't have A.J. Brown. Uh, Reed Blankenship did not play. The Bucks just marched on the first drive. Eagles bad tackling, had to settle for a field goal. Then Baker, I'll tell you this, I thought Baker had an awesome game. Awesome game. He was on fire early as David Moore had two catches on the same drive, including a long touchdown, breaking tackles as Eagles DBs were running into each other. So it was 10 nothing as the Bucks dominated the first quarter. Eagles still had no answer for the blitz. Bucks again had a good drive. I mean, then the theme after that was Bucks good drives, but settling for field goals as the Eagles would do a better job in the red zone. Eagles finally got a drive with a couple of Devontae Smith plays, but then they don't run the ball. I didn't know why. They didn't hardly ever try to run the ball. No answer for the blitz. Jake Elliott hits a field goal. It's 13-3. Bucks had a bunch of drops that helped out the Eagles tremendously. Settled for another field goal, 16-3. And then the Eagles showed life. Jalen Hurts threw a bomb to Devontae Smith which led to a Dallas Goddard touchdown. Uh, and then the, the Bucks jumped, so the Eagles went for two. They got stopped on a tush push. That was a bad omen. That was a real bad omen. When the unstoppable play is stoppable, not good. I, I, don't, I really don't understand all the empty sets by the Eagles on offense. It doesn't really let you take advantage of your offensive line because the other team just brings one more guy than you have. So that was surprising and uh, disappointing. Um, the uh, Hertz was sacked for a safety. Absolutely terrible job by him to be sacked for that safety. They were like at the 15-yard line. You can't take a safety there. That made it a two-score game. 
Then there was another broken tackle by Bradbury from Trey Palmer. Led to a touchdown, 25-9. And then who cares after that? I think the Eagles are done, and I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out to MyFrontPageStory.com. I'm telling you guys, now is the time to go to MyFrontPageStory.com, get the best Valentine's Day gift you could ever get a loved one. Then you got BackOfficeSchedule.com, SteakhouseSports.com, HumanHeadNYC.com, Sportaculture, and Pizza Boy Brewing.